Thank you. Good afternoon. Are you having a good day? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Once again with conviction. Are you having a good day? Yes. <laughs> so much better. Great. Okay. Uh, and I have to say, it's a real privilege to be invited, actually. I, I love what Edinburgh City Mission do. I love it. I was watching about, I mean, I, I've known Duncan for a while, but the authenticity of what happens in this organization is what gets me every time. I just love what they do. So thanks for the invitation, Duncan, whenever you ask. Um, okay. If we are going to love our neighbors well, if we are going to see true transformation, then we need to start with restoration. There's a, a model that describes poverty like this as a systematic oppression. It's getting a bit deep, aren't we, after lunch? A systematic oppression in our society resulting in the poor being trapped in disempowerment in five interacting systems, social, cultural, personal, biophysical, and spiritual. And so we need a holistic understanding of poverty that in simple terms recognizes that poverty regardless of social status as a result of dysfunctional, fragmented and oppressive relationships. Whether that's a relationship with yourself, within the family, within community, within the state or with the state, with God, dysfunctional, fragmented and oppressive relationships. And so part of our restoration needs to, our, our transformation needs to start in restoration of those relationships first with ourselves, restored personhood. We see the image of God in each person, the imprint of God, our creator, in each person we come across. John Vania talked about becoming more fully human. Uh, and the church has got a role there, creating places of belonging. Works of mercy, our social action, should renew personhood and should not oppress in any way. It should always empower, should always give agency. Uh, we need to see re restored relationships amongst people, whether that's in families or in, in, uh, in workplaces or in college or whatever, just amongst each other. We need to see restored relationships. Um, making, making friends, so I should probably say, see all this loving your neighbor stuff. That's just Christian for making friends. You do understand that, don't you? Uh -huh, right, so loving our neighbours, the Christian version, we're making friends, we're talking about making friends here, but it's costly, <laughs> it's challenging, it's not convenient and it takes time. Paying attention to somebody, it's called paying attention for a reason, because it costs something in us to give. And so when we are talking about befriending, when we're talking about building relationships, like Alan was talking about this morning, forgiveness, <laughs> you know, he's not here so I can embarrass him. He, this, this, is, this is worked out, modeling that forgiveness, modeling these restored relationships. When you've got young people living with you who, who focus all their dysfunctional, fatherless growing up and project it onto the father figure that's in the house that results in, in physical as well as verbal attack, that results in their car getting stolen and written off. And when, the, when your reaction to that is, this lad needs more relationship, not less. That, that, ladies and gentlemen, is forgiveness. That is modeling restored relationship. And that is what we need to be doing for some of these folk round about us who have never seen anything like it in their lives. So, we see restored personhood, we see restored relationships, and we see restored community. Um, our acts of mercy must translate into justice. It can't be divorced from social justice. We, we see all through the Old Testament and beyond the prophets calling out the, uh, the religious structural oppression. We need to see institutions challenged. We need to call it out when the government, when our count, local councils, when organizations, statutory organizations round about us are getting it wrong. We need to open our mouth and say something. Transform faith communities will transform communities round about us. And to, we need to start with restoration of relationship. Okay, and then, if we are going to love our neighbors well, if we're gonna make friends, we need to lead with embrace. Um, Miroslav, uh, if it, yeah, just keep that down. Uh, Miroslav Volf, there's a, he was a Croatian theologian 
Uh, plenty to say about this. He was brought up as a Christian in Marxist Yugoslavia, for those of you who are all old enough to remember Yugoslavia. Um, and he lived through that, that terrible time, that terrible time of ethnic cleansing in the Balkan Wars. He has first-hand experience of what it means to be the outsider, the other. He says, the act of exclusion takes place because of an unwillingness to depart from one's own culture. And this means that if we, if we are going to love our neighbours, if we are to be agents of reconciliation, to be peacemakers, we must choose to make space for the other to enter in. And he talked about it in terms of Borak drama. Now, I know you've all just sat down again, but if you're able, going to stand up for me. Just, just, if you're able, stand up. Um, the first act of this drama that Volk talked about, he said, was making, making space. So, can we create some space? Uh, hold, hold your arms out. This is your space for embrace, okay? We're, start, we're leading with embrace. Uh, so, this is act one of the drama. Now, while, we're do, while I'm doing this, I'm also going to tell you about some of our kids. Now, when I talk about our kids and refer to one of my boys or whatever, I've got two boys of my own, my own, and then we've got a whole load of other young people that have lived with us at various points over the years. Um, so, yes, you can tell the difference because my own boys are like man mountains and the, the rest of them are all small. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we, the, the story I want to tell you about this is about uh, Leanne, who came to stay with us when our own boys were quite young. And uh, she'd been kind of around the edges of the church and she'd uh, kind of, I don't know, come and go. We came from a, what the social work euphemistically describe as a, a chaotic family background. You can read into that whatever you like. Anyway, she was coming in and coming out, and coming in and coming out. And uh, eventually she came and said to us at one point, uh, my mum's going off to Tenerife for the week with her new boyfriend. I don't want to stay in the house on my own. So she would have been about 17 at this point. Uh, can I come and stay with you? No problem, said us. Come stay with us. That's fine. She came for a week and she stayed for three years. That's the way it goes. <laughs> we love her. Um, so anyway, act one, making space. We've made space for Leanne. Act two is waiting. Are your shoulders sore? <laughs> this is painful, isn't it? This is this costly, building relationships and stuff is costly. Act two in Bull's four act drama is waiting because we need to wait for people to feel safe enough to come into the space, to come close, to draw near. We need to make it, make it okay. And so we have to wait. And then you'll be pleased to hear act three is embrace. Oh, that's better, isn't it? <laughs> And Leanne came in and was embraced by our family. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it was amazing and, you know, she came to faith and everything was rosy thereafter. It really wasn't. It was an absolute roller coaster, as you can imagine, with some of these traumatized young people. But we loved her for three years and she stayed with her for three years and she's now all grown up with four boys of her own and doing great and we still see her and we still love her and it's just fab. But that roller coaster, act four, release. You've got to give them space. Thank you for uh, doing that. You can sit down now. <laughs> but this, this, uh, this thing about creating space is so vital. When we, when we think about our community, I think about like both, um, we're talking to Mary at lunchtime, the nations and all these um, minority ethnic churches, uh, listening to the stuff about asylum seekers and refugees. So we've, we've got two Vietnamese girls living with us just now. I've done boys most of the, my life, and we've got these two little girls well, they're 17, but they're wee. Uh, they're great. Anyway, why did I, that's a tangent. When, when we're thinking about refugees or asylum seekers, when our government is talking about proposals for, to solve the problem of exclusion, whether that's about asylum seekers or whether that's about older isolated people or whether it's whoever it is, they are focused on social arrangements. What kind of society should we be to accommodate this individual or communal difference? But instead, Volf says to us, what kind of self, what kind of self do we need to be in order to live in harmony with others? This is a work of reconciliation. Volf says that at the heart of the cross is Christ's stance for, of not letting the other remain an enemy and of creating space in himself for the offender to come in. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This will to give ourselves, 
give of ourselves to others, to welcome them as prior to any judgment about who they are, except seeing the image of God in them, except identifying with their humanity. And so the will to embrace needs to precede any truth about, hello, truth, about others and any construction of their justice. Okay. If we are going to love our neighbours well, we must approach with a posture of humility. Um, there's a book called Walking with the Poor that I really like, and I'll refer to a couple of things, but in it, uh, Brian Myers is the author, he talks about the God complex of the non-poor. I just love that phrase, and oh my goodness, we're so prone to it in the church. The God complex of the non-poor. No matter what it is, and do you know, and I see it in my young people as well, I see it in the kids that come and stay with us, if they think they've got something sorted, God complex, because they can tell everyone else what it's like. But I'm so blind sometimes to our own poverty when we're like that, aren't we? Anyway, the, ch the church, dare I say, has a little tendency towards a bit of a messiah for complex. We do like to kind of sweep in and save people, you know, don't we? But that's not our job. We've got a saviour in Jesus. Our job is to come alongside. We need to have a shift in our thinking that allows us to recognise our own brokenness, our own need, and to to identify with the, the challenges and the hurts and the pain and the joy and the happiness and the um, just the, the life-giving thing that it is to be part of community and working and walking alongside with folk. <clears throat> I think we need a willingness as well to play, to play the long game. We do want to see our communities transformed. We do want to see the neighbourhood one for Christ. But can we just hold off for a minute until we've learned everybody's names and heard some of their stories, maybe shared a bit of their pain and connected with, with them in a real way, not just in an evangelistic tick box exercise. We need authentic relationship. The, I, I said I was going to tell you kind of stories. One of my stories for here is they, so any of you had children at primary school, you know how you go and stand at the school gate there's always, there's kind of one mum that's in charge. Now she's not officially in charge. She's not in the parent council or anything like that. But everybody checks with her before anybody agrees to it. Do you know who I mean? Those of you that had kids in primary, I'm not even seeing any nods, but I don't have any glasses on. There's, and so in White Edge Primary, it was a, a woman called Sammy. A, and Sammy was, she, just by, by sheer force of personality, I think, was in charge. And uh, at the time, at my kids were at primary school, I was running the kids' church, the, we called it Revolution. We called it Revolution. Uh, and, so, and a lot of the mums sent their kids to Revolution. And so we'd, we'd probably, at its biggest, it was probably about 70 or 80 kids coming, most of whom were unchurched kids. We were a wee church plant, and we didn't, there wasn't a lot of kids in, in the church, but we had a lot of kids from the community. And so I knew a lot of the parents, I knew a lot of the kids. They all got the same thing, but there was still, oh, that's Diane, she's the minister's wife, you can't swear in front of the minister's wife. <laughs> oh dear, terrible. Anyway, so I was back at uni, uh, briefly, uh, in that, and in amongst all that, I didn't, an exercise to do, I needed a group of women to trial this material, this group material, uh, and I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So I thought, right, I'm going to go and ask Sammy. So off I went, Sammy, how are you doing? How are you doing, Diane? Uh, I need your help. Well, that one sentence completely shifted the dynamic of our relationship because she suddenly went from being Sammy, you know, bustling and in charge and, you know, sorting everybody out to, she needs my help. <laughs> completely changed our relationship. Um, so I explained what I needed and she was like, no problem, leave it with me. Literally for the next week, we had, as a group of women, helping me run this material, trail it, and I, I passed my uni course, you'll be pleased to hear, that was good. Uh, but out of the back of that, we did this whole thing, it was actually an um, alternativity, if any of you come across them, it's good material, run up to Christmas. But then in the back of that, we then did a parenting group, and then in the back of that, we did Alpha. And <laughs> in the back of that, there was this group of women who had never sat down and talked about anything serious, never been asked about their life, never had, folk, had given each other space to hear, talk about the deep things that were going on in their lives. It, it was an amazing group, it was an amazing group. 
and it all t and it all happened because I was willing to say I need help. Go and give me a hand with this, and it it happened. We need to come with a posture of humility. Um, I love this quote from Daniel Niles. He says, um, Jesus was a true servant because he was at the mercy of those he came to serve. And then he says, uh, to serve from a position of power isn't true service, but beneficence. Are we willing to give up control? Are we willing to <laughs> hand over the reins? We're, we're sometimes a bit, you know, we've got an agenda and that's kind of okay, but actually my, my God might be asking us just to put that down for a minute and just get on with folk, make friends, and then see where we go with it. Okay, so if we are going to love our neighbours well, then I think it takes three, these three elements. We need to listen first, we need to understand, and then we need to act. We must listen to our friends in our neighbourhoods. Uh, because if we're not listening, we're not loving. If we're not actually hearing who they are and what their hopes and fears and dreams and ambitions and challenges are, if we're not hearing all that, that's not real friendship. That's just somebody you know. We need to build authentic friendship. That's why I love the city mission. There's authentic relationship in there. I love it. Um, so we need to listen first. We need to grow in understanding. We need to work out what's going on beneath the surface and then act with them as far as possible. Include them, work with them. Not, not just bringe off on our own and say, oh, I can help with that and come back with a solution, but actually work out. I've got another school gate story. So one of my, my youngest son, uh, his best pal for most of primary school was a kid called Ewan. And Stevie and Ewan were, were uh, you know, that kind of inseparable way that boys do. So one of them wanted to start karate, so they both had to start karate. One of them joined the football team, so they both joined the football team. Kind of like that. And Ewan was great, a really nice lad. Uh, and I got to know his mum a bit. Uh, and she had decided to go back to, to go out to uni to do nursing. And, uh, and so we were chatting, and we used to chat, and uh, we'd, we'd got to the stage where we went and had a coffee occasionally while the boys were off doing stuff. We would grab a coffee and have a blather and stuff. So I, I kind of knew her quite well by this point. And she, um, she was saying to me, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. The, my, my nursing course is at the stage where I'm going in placement. But of course, nursing shifts start at the crack of dawn and finish at the crack of dawn. And she said, my mum and dad can help me out later on, but she said, I can't give them the kids at like half six or quarter seven in the morning. <laughs> Maybe you can. <laughs> okay. You know, remember, the, remember earlier on when I said that um, befriending is costly and not always convenient? Okay, so Ewan, wide awake at quarter seven in the morning, because he'd already been up for half an hour, <laughs> started turning up at our house when his mum was in placement. Because that's what you do when with you with your friends. The bold you and, so, and my, do you know my abiding memory is sorry, my abiding memory is uh, um, at one point they got into a toilet roll snowball fight. Have you ever done that with your kids? Like roll up toilet roll to make snowballs. So in our old house the kind of landing split and the kind of toilet was at the back and the bedrooms were at the front and they, the pair of them sat and just <laughs> the toilet roll snowball. I'm like, it's like seven o'clock in the morning, will you please just go and get dressed and get ready for school? <laughs> it's not convenient, but it was fun. It was fun. You've got to turn it into an adventure, don't you? Um, but the other thing that that, that conversation with Nicole turn, uh, turned into was a conversation about after school care or out of school care in our community. Because at the time, neither the, neither the non-dom nor the Catholic primary school had after school care. So, the practical, immediate need was met. She dropped you off at me at quarter to seven in the morning, and that was fine, short term. Long term, well, do you think there's other parents who need out of school care? Let's ask. So we chatted to some of the parents at the school gate. I had a friend that worked up at the other, the, the Catholic school, so I asked her to ask around. And we ended up with a, a group of about, I think about 10, uh, all mothers, sorry guys. Uh, all mothers coming together and we set up an after school care project or an out of school care project. Now, this, this is a bunch of women that had never done any kind of community development, anything like that. I mean, they were, they were slightly horrified at the idea when I called it that. They were like, what? No, we're just setting up a project for our kids. But they, they came together and set up this after school project. It was great. And, and used the community centre for it. Now, 
to me, that, that's kingdom, isn't it? That's listening, finding out what's going on underneath, acting, acting at two levels. One, in the relational way. Okay, yes, you can come at quarter to seven in the morning. <laughs> Honest, it's fine. You can come. But then at, at a community level, we responded to a need and discovered that need wasn't just felt by that one person, but actually a whole load of people in the community needed that service. And so we worked together to bring it about. Now, again, I would love to say, you know, a few months of applying for funding and sort of stuff out, and it was all there. It wasn't. It was a bit of a, it was the usual, you know, it takes a while. We, you, we tell these stories from the stage, and you, and you all think, oh, that's amazing. And we miss out all the blood, sweat, and tears and funding applications and, <laughs> and trying, to, trying to teach good governance and all, all the stuff that kind of goes, I fight with the bank and <laughs> all the things that happen. But, you know, we got there. It worked. And there's now, or there was an after school, or out of school project that ran in Wetlands for a long time. It was great. So we need to listen and understand and act. Um, I'm going to, I want to tell you about uh, another project that happened in Wetlands. I've got the photo here. Um, so the council in Wetlands, or the council in Glasgow, decided that uh, Wetlands needed something to commemorate the shipbuilding. Now, I don't know how many of you know Glasgow well enough, but White Inch is where the Clyde Tunnel pops up. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of anger still in the community about they ripped the heart out of our community when they built that tunnel because they knocked down a lot of the old tenements and where White Inch Cross was and all the rest of it. So the council decided in their infinite wisdom that they were going to produce this little space. So where the old cross would have been, they were going to put up this kind of metal water feature thing that was supposed to be about the Clyde and the ships and stuff and they put these little concrete benches in and all that kind of stuff. Anyone want to guess how long the water feature lasted after the opening? A day. <laughs> and we, we made it past one day. Yeah, we, we got to about two and a half weeks. <laughs> it wasn't great. Anyway, uh, the, whole, the whole idea was that people could come through and look and sit and all the rest of it and these concrete benches, I mean, they were terrible. So um, the council did their thing. That was fine, bless them. <laughs> the area, which was supposed to be this lovely walk through, sit and contemplate thing, very quickly became the place where the young people hung out. Uh, and so everybody avoided it because all the young people were there. So some of our young people. Now, at the same time, we were, uh, had been approached by the community council because we'd been running like summer programs and all that kind of stuff and a bit, doing a bit of detached work and the community council came and said, could you do something with these young people? <laughs> we were like, well, we kind of know some of them anyway. Yeah, but they need a bit more. This is, so I have to tell you, this is an ex-head teacher on the community council who had very strong opinions about what should be happening with the young people. <laughs> we were like, yeah, okay, well, how about we do something and you don't? Leave it, leave it with us. So we went and spoke to the young people. As I say, we, were, we knew we had a relationship with some of them anyway. Um, cause through the summer programs, and we did a wee bit of detached work. So we kind of went and chatted to them. So what do you need? What do you need? And basically, what, what we discovered was that there was, we had a whole load of particularly young men in our community who were just disconnected. They didn't feel they had a place at school. They didn't feel that they were wanted in their community, and that's partly why the, this cross bit had um, become the kind of gathering place for them. They just felt disconnected and couldn't. They couldn't seem to get anywhere. And so we decided we would do two, or we, in conversation with them, because you know, you always, do, you do with and alongside, you don't do it to them or for them. So with them, we said, well, how about we set up some kind of drop-in space for you? Because that kind of sounds like something you want, fine. And then how about we try and get some folk that can spend time with you one-to-one, -one, that can answer your questions, that can maybe encourage you a bit. So effectively, we set up a mentoring project and so some of these kids were like, sounds fab. And so with all these young guys who were suddenly getting attention from an adult that they just never had before, what a transformation in some of these young guys' lives. Because they'd never had an adult that would sit down and ask them seriously about their dreams and their hopes and their ambitions and their fears and what was going on at school and how awful it was and how, what was going on even in their families. And so, these young guys suddenly found their voice. Now, the photo that's here, <laughs> it's a couple of things about this photo. 
This is actually the side of Whiting's Cross, and if you go, if you pass, you drive past there now, you'll still see some of these pictures. This is from about 15 years ago. And let me tell you, there are some of these lads that I'm glad I knew when they were 10, because they're now hulking giants. <laughs> you walk past them in the street, I'm thinking, oh, I wouldn't like to meet you in a dark night. Anyway, um, but those, some of those pictures are also still there. So we did this whole big arts project with them, uh, and where they got to talk about what, was, what it was like to live in White Inch, and they got their faces up on the wall. And this was the kind of grand unveiling of the things. Now, the lad in the middle who's pointing at his picture rather than looking at the camera, that's Alex. Uh, that was pretty typical, <laughs> looking at something else when he was supposed to be doing whatever was going on. He um, was one of a small group at the point where we, need, we got money for a new youth worker. Alex was one of the crowds, uh, because again, you do with, you don't do for. So with them, we said, we've got money for a youth worker, do you want to help us recruit? Oh yes, they were very into that. So we had a big chat about what, what made a good youth worker and what we were looking for, and we drew up a list of questions. And so the deal was that the board were going to do one set of interviews, and the young people were going to do another set of interviews. And let me tell you, I was praying like mad that we agreed that the same person was the best. But anyway, um, the day came, interviews happened, the candidates all went to the drop-in, where the lads had their list of questions. Now, let me tell you, this list of very sensible questions that we'd sorted out completely went by the board within about 10 minutes. And so we'd all these questions like, do you have a tattoo? <laughs> uh, if you met us in Dumbarton Road and we were drunk on a Friday night, what would you do? I have to say, not an unreasonable question, because, you know, they're wanting to know about trust and confidentiality and do you actually care or are you more worried about what a better appearance? Anyway, all that. Fortunately, the young people decided on the same person that we thought we liked best. And so at the end of the night, I'd said to the guys, great, we've decided who we want in, or you've decided, that's it, fab. Who wants to phone her and tell her? The bold Alec, I'll do it, I'll do it. So there he is, on the phone, nine o'clock at night. It was really nice to meet you earlier. Would you like a job? <laughs> she said yes. Uh, <laughs> that was great. We ate, Alex was heard the next day, stoning down to Barton Road, telling everybody he met, I gave somebody a job yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to love him. Uh, anyway, why am I telling you that? Because these young people who so struggled in school, who so struggled in their families, who so struggled in our community, and the police just moved on and moved on and moved on, found a voice, found a place of belonging, found a space where they were wanted and welcomed and listened to and heard and because of something that the church did. But not just the church, because it wasn't just the church that was involved in setting that thing up. It was the community council, it was folk who came and volunteered as mentors, it was, it was, it was, a whole, it was the community who came and found these folk a place. But that, that is transformation, ladies and gentlemen, isn't it? That is restoration of relationship. That is transformation of community. That is young people people who are anyone who's excluded, finding belonging, finding voice. Now, where does that leave us? That leaves me time to talk, stop talking. Let me, let me pray for you before we finish. You might have heard this before, it's a Franciscan benediction. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, superficial relationships so that we may live from deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation of God's creation so that we may work for justice and freedom and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with just enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and all our neighbours through our prayer. Amen.